Listen, before we go any further tonight, we're here tonight because, for example, Paul told Timothy right before Paul was heading off to his death, the Apostle Paul, he warned Timothy and he said, oh, Timothy, guard that which has been committed to your trust of avoid profane and vain babblings and things offered up as falsely called science. Today, we live in an age of a battle for information. Yes, I'm going to get more letters. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to get more letters tonight, like every Sunday, where we're turning you into the IRS. We're going to, you can't do that, what you just did on stage. Let me tell you, the scripture tells us to contend earnestly for the faith. That means everywhere. That means not only in Sunday school, that, that's not only in the office place, that's not only in the park, it is in the church. And it's in the world that you and I live in. And so the fact of the matter is, these young women are willing to die for their conviction. And I'm glad they're running, but we need more men also to run for office too. And, to, and lead the way. We need to take back California. But here's the thing. Not take back California for political reasons. We need to take back California for godly reasons. For godly reasons. And that is the freedom to preach the gospel. And the gospel is that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin and my sins. Jesus Christ, God incarnate, God in the flesh, rose again from the dead on the third day. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, nobody can get to the Father but through him. Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so you make sure that you read your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. But you need to read John chapter 3. If these words I just said to you are strange... You need to read John chapter 3. That's Jesus' letter to you. And you need to give your heart to Christ and follow Jesus. And Lord willing, soon, we won't need a California and we won't need an America because we'll be in heaven with him forever. So until that time comes. I'm going to introduce tonight really a guest and yet a host. This brother of mine, we were separated at birth. Um, he, uh, is, he sits on the city council for uh, the city of uh, Thousand Oaks. He was the mayor of Thousand Oaks when all of the horrific shootings took place at that, uh, at the bar and corral thing, borderline, borderline uh, bar, the whole catastrophe of that. And at the same time, remember the fires that were going on? And uh, Rob McCoy being the mayor, city council, but first of all, Rob McCoy, through it all, was still the pastor of his church. Give a warm welcome tonight to Pastor Rob McCoy. And um, not to mention that I think he might be in the future, one of the soon coming governors of California, if I have it my way. So, but that's something, that's something we won't tell anybody about yet. Thanks. You Appreciate know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to have you introduce our special guest. How's that? Uh, whatever you, frost Rob. your cupcakes. Yeah, all right. I, I got this. Oh, you do? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, stay here, Pastor Jack, because uh, I know our guest wants to talk about you, and he wants to do it in front of you. I don't, want to, I don't want to be talked about. I'm not asking for permission. He doesn't need an introduction, but I will do it anyways. He's, uh, there's 2,100 chapters. Charlie Kirk, here he is, there he is. You want to, you were saying, you wanted to say, I left I him out like here for you to. I feel like something's up. No, we were just going to talk about you. I, I, do you want I, me to turn my back? No. no. I, I just wanted to say quickly, I travel the country a lot. I go to a lot of different churches. Our country would be in a much better position if we had 100 or 500 or 1,000 Jack Hibbs. And he is courageous. He has conviction. And the kingdom and the country need more people and more pastors that stand up for truth like Jack Hibbs. So, Jack, Amen. God bless you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
well, you wanted to sit down. I want to stand for a little bit. My back hurts. Uh, so uh, Charlie and I got connected uh, through a couple of events and we've just been knitted at the hip ever since and I've just come to deeply appreciate him. And I'm going to set the stage because you're familiar with what Charlie does, but I wanted to tell you from a unique perspective as a pastor and a politician how critical the work that Charlie does around the country in Turning Point USA. The church is anemic in this one sense that we, we love the gospel, that's not the anemic part, but we have truncated the gospel and made it myopic. And what I mean by that is we, we love the idea that we're saved by grace through faith, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, amen? amen. And we've all been saved by that. Now we know that in, in Ephesians chapter three, but that saved by grace didn't begin in the New Testament. You go back to Genesis 15, and God said that Abraham believed the Lord and it was accredited to him as righteousness. So grace was in Genesis 15, that's the proto, that's the very first appearance of it, and here we have it in the New Testament, we're all saved by it. So Abraham was saved by grace, he was looking forward to a point in time by faith, which was a cross, we look back to a point in time by faith, which is the cross. But what happened is after Abraham got saved, and he was the father of the faithful, 430 years later, God gives the law. Why? Three to five million Jews were enslaved in Egypt, God delivers them because they're crying out in their slavery, which God never intended. He had created government through the Noahic Covenant. And so these three to five million people are delivered from slavery by 10 miraculous plagues, the last being the Passover, the, the angel of death passing over the lamb, and you know the story. They go into the wilderness after Pharaoh's army is vanquished in the Red Sea and drown, and they end in the wilderness, which is a polite way of saying desert. And why they're there, their clothes don't wear out, their shoes don't wear out, food is provided every morning in the form of manna and water where there wasn't water appears. And God even blows quail off course to feed them. 40 years. And then Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and God gives him a downloaded moral app. The Ten Commandments. First five is vertical, our relationship with the Lord. Second five is horizontal, our relationship with each other where you see the cross. The fifth commandment is a flip because it's not only honor thy mother and father, the only one that comes with a promise you'll live long on the earth. It's to honor your father in heaven and to honor your mother and father because that's the, the order of family and the building block of, of society. He comes down the mountain, there's a party going on, golden calf, they're all in debauchery, and he brings the law. That law is placed in the center of the community, which is the temple, and the, the nation revolves around it. Now, the greatest miracle of all, of all the ones I've listed, is that three to five million people lived together for 40 years without a police force or a standing army because they had moral law. Now, the church in the last 50 years has abdicated its responsibility of educating its congregants to engage in the public square. We have become moral pietists. We think politics is dirty, but as Aristotle said, politics is the highest form of community. It, it, it applies morality and sociability. What Charlie Kirk and Turning Point USA does that has been instrumental for me as a minister who understands the pulpit, but more importantly, the, the political side where I'm waiting for the church to help is that Charlie builds a bridge out of Galatians chapter three, verses 23 and 24. The law is a school teacher to point us to Christ, and it keeps us safe until faith comes. So he has a secular organization that invites every realm of young people, and some of you are gonna take issue with who participates in Turning Point USA, don't, because he provides them the law so that they can come to faith. What he does is political, the byproduct is spiritual. Welcome with me, Charlie Kern. Thank you, thank you, Ron. thank you. Thank you. And it, it, excellent, Rob, super well said. And well, thank Rob, you very Rob much. has been a, a, an amazing mentor to me personally, and uh, it, it's incredible to see how few pastors have courage in this broken culture. And Jack and Rob are two of them. And when I visit some of these churches and I confront you know, some of these pastors as, as lovingly as I can, I say, what's it going to take? Is it going to take. 4,000 abortions a day for you to speak up? Is it gonna take drag queen story hour for three-year-olds for you to, for, to speak up? Is it gonna take you know, for, them, for the church to be totally shut down for you to speak up? 
And I, I wonder where's the line that's gonna be crossed for, unfortunately, there's two ways to organize the thinking of it, which is part of the church is basically, they're silent because they don't know how to react. Right. And, and they, they've been taught that Christianity and the church should be absent of politics, which is wrong, it is incorrect. The other part is, and there's a faction of this, which is they're complicit in it, is that they believe in a, almost a Christian Marxist worldview, and they conflate wrongly the, the teachings of love and tolerance of sin, and they conflate them in a, in a very dangerous way. An, an example would be where you see the, you know, some of these churches come out and they say, without saying any names, and some pastors, and they say, well, it's not our position to take a stance on life or abortion. And, and I ask myself, what on earth would you take a stance on, if anything, then? You are the moral center of a community. And if you can't take a very simple stand of when human life begins, why should we trust you with anything else from that point forward at all? You know, Charlie, our founders gave us the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution. And it's interesting that it... It begins with the preamble that, that, that declares who the sovereign in America is. And every nation has a sovereign. In America, the sovereign is the first three words of the preamble, we the people. But every sovereign needs a counselor. The president has his cabinet, right? Kings have their counselors. Our founders understood after they gave us the seven articles of the Constitution that didn't give us any rights and protected the rights given to us by God. And then they gave us the counselor, the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. The freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, the freedom to peaceably assemble for a right of redress of grievances against the government. And the idea is the pulpits are supposed to be the counselor to the king, you. And if the press is bought and the pulpits are silent, the king is in trouble. And I am so grateful you have a wonderful, wonderful counselor, not only Jesus, but Jet Pastor Jack, yeah. amen? And what we have to look at the other side, leftism, if you will, for lack of a better term, as a religion and they view it as a religion. And California is a perfect test case of what happens when this religion goes unchecked. When we don't view it, when we have to view this as a sinister force that will deconstruct a culture or a state. And I want you to think about this for a second. The left takes the welfare state, they take abortion funding as seriously as a devout Jew will take Yom Kippur. If you dare take away abortion funding to a leftist, they will protest, they will March in the streets as if you were going to take a religious, for a religious, Jew, the holy, a religious Jew the holiest day of the year out of their capacity to do it. They view this religiously. And so then I, I'm just amazed, but I'm inspired by churches such as this. And they're starting to pop up more and more because it's going to be the church, which I believe is the sleeping giant in this country that will be awakened to actually fix this. And I'm... I'm amazed at how pastors will get up and they will give great and terrific sermons on salvation and on eternal, eternal damnation or eternal salvation. And they won't care about if they're offending anyone about their eternity. But when it comes to men who think they are women participating in high school sports, that's way too political. That's something that we can't, can't take a stance on. You know, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and Palatine High School was the kind of the poster child for this entire transgender nonsense debate, where a man who thought he was a woman wanted access to the female locker room. And it was lawsuits, three years of lawsuits, and the church was silent. Now the church in the, in the local area did not participate in school board races, in the mayor election, the state rep races, and eventually through lawsuits and the capitulation of the school board, this man who thinks he was a woman is now allowed to go into the female locker room. Now, it takes us, and the, you know, Pastor Rob can tell us, what, a couple chapters before God says, you know, and he created man and woman. It's not that complicated. It's basically as when, simple when as did it the, gets. When did the church become the defenders of science? Right. And two genders, right? There's you only, can laugh at that. Thank you. And there are only two genders, scientifically, Amen. biologically, realistically, spiritually, and theologically. It's, it takes... If, if you believe there are more than two genders, you must have a doctorate degree from a California university to believe something <laughs> that silly. You must be taught that. It's not self, it's not self, self evidentiary. And, but what, what is the goal of the modern left? And I hope this can make sense 
for everyone here. And we have to boil it down as simple as this. There's one side that wants to create chaos and one side that wants to bring order from the chaos. Everything the left does seeks to create more chaos. Open borders create chaos by definition. Creating racial tension creates chaos. Cr having people confused about their gender from a young age creates chaos. And what's happening more times than not, and here's the good news I can deliver to all of you because I visit these campuses, is when young people have lived in a decade of chaos from age eight to 18, of not being sure what gender they're supposed to pick, not sure if there's a God at all whatsoever, all of a sudden there's a need for awakening and a revival and a, rebirth, and a rebirth. And you've seen some really good signs and indications of this. And guess what? We have these answers because our book, The Holy Word of God, is the same as today as it was 2,000 years ago. And we have the, and it will be 2,000 years from today, it'll be exactly the same. Is that first there was the Word, and the Word tells us what, what the Word tells us how many genders there are, how to interact with our government, how we should interact in marriage, how we should interact civilly, and yet if immigration. You, immigration, borders, rule of law, sovereignty. Yet if you ask a leftist, what is your reference point? Every single one of them will give you a different answer. Well, they might say it's the Communist Manifesto. They might say it's the Rachel Maddow show. They might say, Woo. they might say it's NPR. Woo. They might say it's the LA Times. Where if you, if you think about it, if they do not have a central reference point, like the word, that's why they're so confused. And confused people try to create more confusion and more chaos. And so we as Christians have to look at a secular world that more than any other time, I think in the history of this country, is breaking under the sin of pornography, the addiction of drugs, and the brokenness of divorce, and people that are just waiting for the order that the Bible and the Word can give, is that each one of you can offer not just eternal life to individuals that are suffering and confused, but you can give them very specific rules for their life that will say, here's some order to the chaos that you might be believing in. You know, that you might be living through. You know, you, you touched on that, Charlie, because as, as we looked at it earlier with the temple being in the center of the community and then three to five million Jews living without a police force or a standing army because the moral law was brought, what's interesting is you get to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and it says you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You, and and, and when, when Jesus took his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, the headwaters of the Jordan, long journey from Galilee, he gets up there and it's a park-like setting if you've ever been there and every god and goddess has a temple built by every culture. So it's a cacophony of noise of all these people worshiping Bacchus and Aphrodite, etc. And in the midst of the cacophony of noise, Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say you're John the Baptist, others say, like, but who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. No. No, no, no. King James said church. Tyndale and the Geneva Bible and the original translators of the Masoretic text said that assembly. You see, Jesus co-opted a secular term. He didn't say synagogue or temple, which would have been a religious term. He used the word ecclesia, which is a governmental term, which means an assembly. And you are an assembly of believers, the temple of the Holy Spirit, infused in the culture to cause it to rise to the glory of God. Now you gather in this larger assembly to be fed, but you go back out and you are that moral preservative. You're the salt of the earth. And so what Charlie's touching on, God bless you, man. You're lighting it up. Well, and, and so I go to college campuses to students that refuse to believe in God, refuse to believe in a higher power. And I last spoke to you guys here and what a warm welcome you guys gave me and thank you for that. This is a church unlike any other except maybe Rob's church, which is pretty <laughs> extraordinary. Seriously. I have, the the, only... I have the gift of preaching a church down to a manageable yes, size, exactly. unlike Jack. Um, <laughs> It's, it's an extraordinary, it's extraordinary. This, this church is unlike any other and it, because it's the courage of the leadership and it's the conviction of the leader and it's, 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 it's something that could be duplicated and a blueprint for the rest of the country. But I spoke at Brown University in mid-December and I spoke with you before that. And, and when, lived to tell and about it. And I lived to tell about it. <laughs> and if you want your child to hate America, send them to Brown University. That's all I have to say. If you want to turn them into an anti-American, godless, atheist, unhappy, radical, send them to Brown University. And so Brown University 
is in Rhode Island, it's in Providence, Rhode Island, it's one of the ruling class universities. Basically, if you get into this school just by saying you went to Brown University, you've been admitted to a country club of sorts that you'll get jobs you don't actually deserve to get just because you went to Brown. There's only about 10 schools like that in the country. California's home to one of them. It's in Palo Alto, I'll let you figure out which one it is. Um, but basically, and it's nothing against the institution, not against the people that go there, but you know exactly the type of school that I'm describing, that as soon as you get through that door, they protect their own. So I spoke there and I was met with protests and opposition, anger and vigor, but the thing that got them the most upset, the thing that got the most mockery, the most repulsion, the thing that made them out of their chair, the thing that made them almost visibly and physically irate is when I said, our rights come from God, not from government. That is what drove them nuts. It wasn't when I said that President Trump is doing a great job. It wasn't that I said we need to build a wall. It wasn't that I said we need to enforce immigration laws, that we need to end abortion in our time, that there are only two genders. All that stuff is true, and I said all those things. That was just the first 30 seconds. It was instead... I like it. Instead... It's when I said, where do our rights come from? Because when I say where our rights come from, which John Locke recognized, right. which our founders were inspired by, and our entire framework of government is designed around, all of a sudden I'm admitting to the brown, hyper-entitled leftist Marxist, you're not the most important person in the world. You're, you actually don't matter as much as he mattered, and what he did for you mattered. And that admittance was met with and I kid you not, a visible repulsion. Now why? Well, it's because they might not be able to continue to live the way that they think they should live. That they might have to drop the lifestyle that they've been following, that they might have to behave differently, that they might have to drop the hubris or be more open-minded or be more humble or other things that we're called to be you know, in the word. And it struck me right then and there that this is really what it comes down to. All of this matters, the fight for life, the fight for basic biological standards, the fight for school choice, the fight for taxes, the fight for sovereignty, the fight for borders. However, if we don't recognize this is a spiritual war first and foremost, that they are fighting for the abolition of a belief in the divine, then we're just arguing X's and O's when there's a much bigger picture at play here. Because as soon as you get a college leftist especially to admit that there is a God, a ubiquitous and omniscient God that has power over them that has granted the rights to you, all of a sudden maybe government doesn't matter as much. All of a sudden that clump of cells that they think is in, that they call a fetus, actually might be a life. If you admit there's a God, all of a sudden right and wrong are not an opinion anymore. Right and wrong are truth that is written in the word. Because if you believe there's no God, right and wrong is just a matter of opinion. It's just, well, this is what I think is right, and this is what I, it's called moral relativism. And what has that got in the world? 60 million abortions since Roe versus Wade, where we have an epidemic of pornography in our country that the whole culture just is acting as if it doesn't exist right now in America. And you see this happen until we recognize where the rights come from, from a divine, then that is the discussion that really needs to begin to happen. And what was so telling to me though, at my, when I closed out my time at Brown and my conversation was of course the opposition, the antagonism. But once you stood firm and you did not care about the arrows, the names, the protesting and the screaming, finally, they begin to crack. Yes, after 40 minutes of protesting and an hour of protesting, something happens that does not usually happen in the mind of an Ivy League Marxist leftist. They began to think. And there's a difference between following and thinking. And God gave us a heart, but he also gave us a mind, analytically and rationally. And if you rationally look at leftism, you will come to the same conclusion, that it is a force of cultural chaos and destruction that will destroy everything that it comes in contact with. Chaos and order, remember that dichotomy. Everything they stand for is about creating more chaos. Now, why else do they want chaos? When you create chaos, it's a great excuse for totalitarianism. When you create chaos, it's a wonderful license Hegelian to make, Dyke. exactly, it's a wonderful license to create a king, a dictator, a ruler, and Rob can explain. Well, I was going to say the Hegelian dialectic, but we don't have time for that. Uh, Charlie, when you go on these campuses, and I imagine one of the struggles with young people, and I think it's difficult for the church to reach young folks, and especially with a conservative message, because their concept of freedom is different than really what the scripture says freedom is. Um, this is such an important point. Now, I, let me just preface it by saying in the 
stairwell of the law school at, at Harvard, and they've been doing it since 1911. They say the law is the wise restraints that make men free. So you apply restraints towards evil in order to pursue excellence. But the younger people, and especially the schools that are indoctrinating them, dictate freedom in a separate way. Why don't you touch on it's that? A, it's a conflation of terms. So young people believe freedom, or they look at freedom as, I can drink whatever I want to drink whenever I want to drink. I can put whatever I want to put in my body. I can do whatever I want sexually at any time. I can use whatever word I want to use. I can go to whatever website I want to use. I can stay up as late as I want to stay up. That is bondage. You will not be a productive, happy, or fulfilled person if you do that for one day, one year, or one decade, or a lifetime. Now, the lie that we teach, teach young people, and we allow this to pass by, and we allow this to pass by without countering, is not only we have to say what is easy is not necessarily good for you, but what is good for you is sometimes difficult. What I find when I find these 18 and 19 and 20 year olds is younger and younger, and those of you that have high school kids are gonna nod in agreement, is that the sin that, w that was impermissible for me as a high schooler is all of a sudden widespread for a 12 and 13 and 14 year old. Yeah. I'm talking about drugs that are more lethal than ever. I'm talking about access to mobile technology that we, and I, I only went to high school eight years ago. I'm talking about websites that would have been forbidden from any sort of person to visit. All of a sudden, you're seeing young people dive into more dangerous and dangerous pervasive sin at a younger and younger age. By the time they're 18 and 19, you have a miserable generation. This is why suicide rates have gone up so alarmingly. It's, it's really interesting when you look at the epidemic of suicide in America because suicide is a unique first world problem. If you look at the poorest countries in the world, their suicide rates are much lower than our country. It would be the exact opposite, you would think, right? They, they sometimes don't have access to medicine, food, clean drinking water, yet their suicide rates are so much lower and they keep, why is that? Well, it's because the reason that people choose that unthinkable choice sometimes is because they think freedom is the freedom to continue to indulge in whatever they want to indulge, however they want. And somehow, at the end of this tunnel, if I just take one more hit and I just visit this website one more time, if I stay up to 5 a.m. one more time, that will bring me happiness. But what the Bible tells us, and Jesus said this so clearly, it's freedom from that sin, it's freedom from that addiction Amen. that will bring you actual liberty, the liberation from that bondage. And that's the message that young people are waiting for every Amen. single day. <laughs> you, you went to school eight years ago. I went to school 38 years ago. Yeah. Uh, now, with this idea, the Apostle Paul, and he wrote this uh, in Galatians, he says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty for which Christ has set you free. And when he wrote that, he wrote that in prison. Now, liberty can come even though you're having to contend with culture. Liberty, in a sense, means doing the right thing. And, and I, I look at liberty and morality as, as equal. In a sense, morality is not doing what's wrong. So I'd say this is a room of moral people. You don't do what's wrong. Most of the time. <laughs> but character is different. Character is doing what's right. So if your child comes home from school and says, Mommy, Daddy, all the kids in the school called Susie fat, but I didn't. You'd say, well, that's the moral thing to do, but where's your character? And they'll say, what do you mean? Why didn't you tell the other children to stop it? Now, when the body of Christ starts getting character, and what I was touched by in the back room talking with Charlie is, is he's, I think you're the most visited citizen to the White House in the United States. He wouldn't say that, but it's true. The president looks at his tweet every morning, which is kind of exciting. I wish he'd tweet about me. <laughs> That'd be really tweet, sweet. But when we were back there, the, the thing that Charlie and I hear continually is this caustic approach to the president. And they don't like the way that he, his mannerisms and the rudeness and the things of that sort. But you touched on his kids and the fact that he enforced a moral law raising them. You can't, yeah, yeah, you can't fake good kids. And I've had the amazing opportunity but to But contrast to, it with some of the Christian families you've run into. Sure. You, that was profound. And I'm going to say it as, as, as lovingly as I can with, I without trying to offend anyone. But. I'm going to stand up because... I'm old. Um, <laughs> Dur. I got, I've, I've, got, I've gotten to know Don Jr., Ivanka, Eric, Tiffany, and Baron a little bit, but the other four quite well. Um, you can't fake good kids. That's what I've learned from my travels and 
from my numerous experiences uh, since starting Turning Point USA and dealing with yeah. students and dealing with kids. The president had a couple rules for his kids from a very young age. First and foremost, if you need to reach me, it's one ring, I'll always pick up the phone. I'm immediately accessible. And every single kid, every, Ivanka, Jared, Iv Ivanka, Eric, and Don, to a T, will tell you they needed to reach their father, it's one ring straight to him. No matter if he's in the most important meeting, developing the most important building in the world, direct accessibility. And he had three very big rules for his kids. No drugs, no alcohol, no cigarettes. Three rules. And he imposed it from a very, from a very, very young age. And he was intentional with raising three, I think, out outstanding citizens of the world that have been so unfairly treated by our media, by the way. And you look, you juxtapose these three outstanding citizens with other people that serve under, we'll just end with that. Yeah, so good. that's all I have to say with that. Don't. However, um, I, what I, the, the zero tolerance policy that the president always had for those three things in particular, and he would repeat it, no drugs, no cigarettes, no alcohol. Um, and I, I think, you know, people say, they say, well, Charlie, I don't like the president's tweets. I don't like uh, his candor and his tone. And Rob has a very, very good response to this. And I'm a little bit fatigued answering this question. But I ask myself the question, I say, so George W. Bush probably was more of your, you know, your tone. Oh, yeah, I liked him. He was always smooth. How many times did he speak at the March for Life? No, never. None. He was married to a pro-abortion activist. Who appointed better justices, George W. Bush or Trump? Not even close. We have John Roberts under Bush, who's questionable at best. We have Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, 187 circuit court judges. Who cut plan, uh, funding to Planned Parenthood? Trump. Who expanded it? George W. Bush. Who actually took on the Iranian threat and killed Qasim Salam, Qasam Soleimani? President Trump. So, who what, moved what, the embassy? Who moved the embassy to Jerusalem? Who recognized the Golan Heights? Who cut the funding to the Palestinian Authority? Who has signed executive orders for religious liberty and has his vice president pray over him almost daily? A very godly man, Mike Pence, who I've had the opportunity to spend time with. And so I get a little fatigued in answering this question, but here's the analogy I always use. America was drowning under bipartisan ruling class rule. So if you wanna know how America's divided, it's not right versus left. It's ruling class versus working class, okay? The ruling class is both parties. You don't have to explain that, we're all from California. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but we were drowning in the middle of the ocean under the ruling class. And finally, there is a light that came in the distance of a helicopter that was gonna rescue us from the middle of the ocean and we get rescued and the person, finally we can breathe again and we look up and the first thing we ask to the person who rescued us is, Oh, I remember you. I don't like your tweets very much. You're breathing. You're living. You're able to advance. You've been resuscitated and revitalized. And you look at the person that might say something that you might not find favorable and someone, and you say, well, you know, yeah, thanks for that whole life-saving thing. Thanks for that, you know, I'm able to continue my life, but your tweets don't really check out with me. And I say to myself, is a smooth politician who lies to your face and continues the destruction of the family and the country, something that you vastly prefer, or someone that biblically might embody Samson, and Rob will be able to articulate this very, very well, who was called by God in an unusual time for a very specific purpose and mission to save a gift and a blessing from God. That is someone that I want fighting for us. Talk about Samson. Okay. I'm supposed to give him segues to talk, and he gave me one. That's really sweet. <laughs> the Lord gave me this picture because uh, we travel the country. We've, I've spoken to over 20,000 pastors across the country trying to awaken them to move the 60 to 80 million evangelical Christians. Half of them aren't registered to vote, and of the half that are registered to vote, only half of those vote in a presidential election, 12% non-presidential. It's apathy. And, and I get a pushback. I can't vote for a man who's been three times married and twice divorced. And I say, look, fine. And then he's caustic on his Twitters. And I hear it all the time. It's moral pietism. And I say, well, that's fine, but just make sure you take Samson out of the hall of faith. And they say, what do you mean? I said, name one moral thing about Samson's life. He was in a prostitute's bed all night and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. I can't teach that in Sunday school. <laughs> Not once, but twice. 
He went to pay off a gambling debt and the spirit of the Lord came upon him. (laughs) And his downfall was women and his iconic hair. I'm not gonna go any further with that, but (laughs) my point is this. Why is he in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11? Why would God pick a guy like that? Judges 14.4. What Samson's parents didn't realize, Manoah and his wife, and by the way, Samson and Jesus are the only two babies in the womb prophesied by God before they were born to lead God's people. And Samson was raised with a Nazarite vow. He was homeschooled. Wait, 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 you're not gonna like the second part of this. He went off the rails because the very first words recorded out of his mouth were, that Philistine woman, I want her, go get her. So watch the homeschool thing. My point is this, my point is this. Why would God choose him? Judges 14.4. What Samson's parents didn't realize is God was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. Samson was willing to do what God's people weren't, confront the evil in their culture. Now, there's seven mountains of cultural influence, arts, entertainment, media, business, politics, religion, education, and family. And of those seven mountains of cultural influence, there's a currency in each one of them. In politics, it's winning elections, in media, uh, in arts, entertainment, it's selling movie tickets, et cetera. So let's look at moving that culture, and let's look at the current president. Arts, entertainment, he had the number one television show in America. Media, just, he's mastered the, the, the Twitter world. Politics, he took out 17 Republican candidates and the most heavily funded Democrat candidate in the history of the nation. Uh, Business, Trump brand is world renowned. We can just go through the whole thing. This is a man who's equipped. And if you don't like him, fine. But you know why God picked him? Because there were no Christians available. Now, some of the candidates running were Christians, but were they equipped in every mountain of cultural influence? So there are times where unless the the body of Christ steps up and starts doing its job and encouraging people to engage in the public square and the work that Charlie's doing that's political and the byproduct spiritual, this is why I wanted him to come. Jack invited me to speak. You don't need to hear from me and I'm gonna shut up in a minute. I wanted him to speak because this is critical. We need to infuse this next generation with moral knowledge. They'll come to faith, but the law will point them there. Support this man. Charlie, you got a podcast, The Charlie Kirk Show. Yes. I've subscribed to it already. If you haven't, the last time we were here, you guys took the show to number three because you signed up on it. That is true. And so. Tell them how to do it. I, I will, and then we do want to get to, to some questions. We're not done yet. I know, us. we're not done yet. So, I'm not, um, I, I, we got to no, hurry, though. Just, I want to thank you guys for the blessing you guys gave me last time. I, I mentioned it. So basically, I have a podcast that comes out three to four times a week. I uh, interview everyone from the vice president to uh, Ben Shapiro to Senator Rand Paul to Senator Ted Cruz. Uh, some great content on there, if I may say so myself. Um, but <laughs> I, I plugged it. I asked you guys to look it up on your phone on the podcast app, and we beat the New York Times for like five days straight, just this room. <laughs> So, um, for, those of you, for those of you that helped, you guys can make sure you're subscribed or help your friends subscribe, but if you guys would do that today, it's a huge blessing to me. Each one of your phones can do it, and it's free of charge, so thank and, you very and much. And one more thing. Tell them, this is really cool, because I have a copy of it already. Tell them about your book. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well, uh, I, have, I have a book coming out uh, in early, Mar- oh, my goodness, two weeks from now. Uh, the president's endorsed it, which we're really excited about. Uh, I could do a whole speech on this, but it's called MAGA Doctrine, the only, only ideas that will win the future. I make the argument that the Trump movement cannot be a moment. It has to be a movement. That what he, what he has done is a fundamental recalibration of ideas that we otherwise would not be considering at all whatsoever on trade and immigration and foreign policy and endless wars, standing for life, impartial judges. And so I actually analyze and develop what his doctrine is philosophically. Uh, so it's available, available for pre-sale. That is not uh, free of charge. That, that is a charge. But if you guys are looking for uh, some way to help, be, help me get on the New York Times bestseller list, which we might do if you guys uh, all help out, you guys can order it for pre-order MAGA doctrine. So Amen. thank you for the shameless plug opportunity. Rob. Hey, that's so. my job. All right. Uh, we, we're going to do some questions because we got about, what, 
Eight, we'll, 17 we'll, minutes? We'll go till they kick us off. That's, yeah. No, time that, is always no. a, su <laughs> it's yeah. a suggestion. You got to. And, and look, I put my jacket on. Woo! So I can be like you guys. So you guys, here's the rules to the questions. Um, you're going to ask your question. You're not going to make a statement. Put a caboose on the end of that train. Okay. And if you're going to make a statement, then the guys in the sound booth are going to cut you off. Ask a question and let it be answered, okay? Second thing is, uh, this is a church gathering. This is a 501c3 religious assembly. And if somebody's here to disrupt a religious gathering, you should know that it's a federal offense. And there are federal and state officers and local officers here <laughs> present. So we, we love all of you. We love all of you, but the rule of law is the will of God. <laughs> and if you get arrested, look, we made a big mistake one time. We had a heckler who started over here in this section, started screaming Allah Akbar, and security took him out sideways. <laughs> then, the, then the police asked me if I wanted to press charges, and I gave him the gospel, and... Um, we didn't press charges, which turned out to be a huge mistake. Nine months later, he was arrested in a terrorist scheme. So we take this very seriously. So um, we'll visit you in prison. We'll send you packages. <laughs> but that's, that's the rules. Man, you even got me nervous. I'm going to go. I... Okay. All right. So who wants to ask the first question? <laughs> you want to get a microphone? Joel, do you have the mic? He's all set. Okay. Phil Donahue, go. go get him. That's a joke for the older people. <laughs> you might want to get a microphone that works. Democrats always go after the Republicans. So, for instance, they get Republicans thrown out of office. You know, the Bidens quit pro quo. He actually admitted to it, but nothing happens to him. But to Republicans, they lose their seats or get thrown in jail. Look, I, I mean, I, I talk about this quite often. There's, we don't have a justice system in our country right now, unfortunately. And hopefully Attorney General Bill Barr can get this sorted out. Uh, what's happening to Roger Stone is one of the great injustices that I've seen in, in recent memory, where you have Andy McCabe, James Comey, John Brennan, and all these others that have had, Andy McCabe in particular, that has had criminal referrals be totally dismissed, and Roger Stone that's facing anywhere between seven to 10 years in prison. Um, it just feels as if, and it's just not a feeling analytically, that if you're against this president right now, you're going to be held at an absolutely unfair level of justice and they're gonna throw you in prison and throw the keys away. But if you're in the opposition, you could basically do whatever you want. We have senators violating the Logan Act, illegally meeting with Iranians overseas, and there will be no criminal charges being held there whatsoever. Uh, illegal spying against our president from the FISA abuse. Look. If you see actually a picture of Lady Justice, Lady Justice is supposed to be blind. It's supposed to be blind to class, to income, any sort of prejudice. It, doesn't, it shouldn't matter what political party you are. Unfortunately, we're living through a time of very, very partial justice, not impartial justice. And that's where the ruling class, working class divide really comes in because what they want to do is they want to create show, tri show trials, which is a Soviet tactic of trying to create an example of anyone that dares side with the insurgent, Donald Trump. That, hey, if you, if you side with him, we're gonna take your life away and your family away. And, we, and that little doubt all of a sudden might make people back away. I think it's having the opposite effect. I actually think that it's making people grow more fervent in their support of the president, be more convicted than ever before to contribute and to knock on doors and to go vote for the president. I think it's having the exact opposite effect, but your observation is exactly right. You gotta make the answer shorter because there's a lot of people. <laughs> okay. So um, just a quick question about, um, I've had a lot of college students come or colleagues say like Jesus is a socialist, but um, just scriptural references that you would um, say just to back against that. F thank you for the question. I, I get that quite a lot. And I, I, get, I get the question, Charlie, didn't you know Jesus was a socialist? Well, first of all, the fact that Jesus might have been something of an ideology that was developed 1,800 years after he lived is an insult to him being king of the world and savior of the world and part of the Trinity as God in himself. He was, 
nothing more, nothing less than God divine and the savior of the world. And say, oh, oh, he was a Marxist. So let me get this straight. So Jesus was something that was a working class failed ideology that was developed in the mid 1800s. Nonsense. What they're really trying to say, what, what, they're, what they're trying to say, but they won't say it is like, oh, Jesus was a collectivist that Jesus would hate the system of private property ownership and he would hate the system of markets and of capitalism. I point to you to a very important parable and a very important recurring theme of Jesus' testimony, which is the theme of multiplication, specifically in the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents, as all of you know, was a parable of a, a owner, if you will, distributing a certain amount of talents, which was a, which was a, a equivalent of a currency yeah. to each of the individuals that worked for him. And the individual that produced the most from the original deposit, if you will, or the original investment, was most pleased in the eyes of the owner. And the individual that produced marginally, but somewhat, was somewhat pleased. But the person who did nothing with the gifts that they were given was basically said they would be put into eternal damnation. It was one of Jesus' most harsh repudiations of action in the entire four Gospels. And to kind of sum it all together, though, you have to ask yourself the question, what system allows the people in the body of Christ to multiply most effectively for the kingdom? Are people mul- were people multiplying in the Soviet Union? Were people multiplying right now for the kingdom in Venezuela where they can't even eat? In order for multiplication to happen, you must have individual freedom and individual liberty. In order for people to multiply, you must have a system that allows multiplication to occur. Bob McEwen gave a, a message here where he covered that, Congressman McEwen, and one of the things he often says is he says that, that for wealth to be created, two parties have to benefit. So if you're a farmer and I'm a baker, I'm gonna buy grain from you at a price that the market will bear, and with the profit you make, you buy more fields, hire more workers. With the, the grain I buy, I bake bread, and when I sell it, with the profit I make, I buy more ovens, hire more workers, and it creates wealth. For wealth to be created, two parties have to benefit. Now. In socialism, we were, and this is why young people are drawn to it, because they see the disparity between the rich and the poor, and they think that this is a system that works even though it's failed in 40 countries over the span of 6,000 years, even though it's a latecomer, it's already had massive failure. But I tell young people, I say, listen, you're getting an A in class because you do your homework and you're smart as a whip and you get up early and you go to bed late and you do what's necessary. You don't do squat. You are lazy and shiftless and you are, you're pathetic. Quite honestly, and I don't know you, illustratively speaking. Hey, 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 take it's it okay. easy. It's okay, it's okay. You're, you're getting an A and you're getting an F. And so we're gonna make equality. We're gonna take two grades from her and give them to you. So you both have a C. Well, what happens is the next time grades come out, you're not gonna work as hard, what's the point? And you're gonna be waiting for your handout, so production's gonna decrease. So you take the fourth greatest economy in the Western Hemisphere, Venezuela, and, and you give it socialism. And now they're eating their zoo animals. It destroys a country. You can vote yourself into socialism, but you're gonna have to shoot your way out. End of story. And I'll, uh, sorry, no, go. go. No, Jack, jump in. No, and one one final Um, point is that Jesus called us individually to be extraordinarily compassionate and long-suffering and loving, individually. However, he never, not once made the argument for a coercive, collectivized government to do that for you, to abdicate that authority to say that the state or the bureaucrat should do that. Never, never. Instead, socialism gives people an excuse not to be generous. Socialism gives you an excuse not to give to charity. Socialism gives you an excuse not to show up at the soup kitchen, to not show up at at the homeless shelter, to not show up at the pro-life clinic or the pregnancy crisis center. All of a sudden, socialism is, oh, um, someone else is taking care of that? Yeah, that's fine. Socialism creates selfish self-centered and secular people. And capitalism is altruistic. We see a increase in giving with capitalism. That's right, Jack, sorry. I'll tell you something of that, Charlie, just with his words, I saw the pictures, I've seen this in real life. Um, Does anybody remember what the acronym USSR means? What? It's, it's It's socialist. I've been to Russia 16, 17 times. Collectively, I probably lived there for, if you put all those visits together, probably half a year. With every visit, with every stay, with every bit of work that I did there, you see, not some, 
but an entire population of individuals that are lifeless. Their government has sucked hope. There is no hope. It has sucked hope out of them. There's no compassion towards someone else, not because Russians don't have hearts, is that they didn't have any capacity to help the person that was hurting. Everybody was exactly the same. They wore exactly the same clothes, and they lived exactly the same flats, and they functioned exactly the same way. I lived it, I saw it. And you need to know that. The young people today don't have a clue of what that does to a human soul. That's why God was banned in Russia. That's why on, in Red Square in Moscow, I had a, a babushka, 80 years old, grandma, come up and grab me by the face, speaking in Russian, crying and kissing me because I was preaching the gospel. And she said, I was 10 years old when the communists came into our home and took our Bibles and took our cross and told us that God did not exist. And she said, I, I was praying for 70 years to hear the gospel again. That kind of stuff happens in socialistic worlds. Do you think uh, Hugo Chavez was going to allow God to be preached in Venezuela when he was alive? They can't tolerate it. China cannot have it because God to them is competition. God gives meaning. God, God gives purpose. And bottom line, second, final point is this. The scriptures demand that every one of us will stand and give an account in the day of judgment for what we did with our lives. If socialism's true, then God's false. God is true, and socialism's wrong. Because socialism gives you, somebody said it, the excuse to not get involved in doing anything. It's godless, it doesn't work, and kids are being sold a bill of goods, frankly, by overpaid, egocentric professors that live in the wrong country now. They've been educated beyond their intelligence. And it's tragic. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming. Um, I had a, maybe an observation. I was wondering what your thoughts were on this. So seeing how our country, like the origins and how God is like inscribed, even in stone, like all over our country, and just seeing how far away we've drifted from where we started, I started kind of analyzing, trying to figure out when that happened. And my only thoughts were when the family started kind of falling apart and seeing mothers kind of going off to work and seeing children kind of, fathers then leaving the homes, home, fatherless homes. And so I'm trying to figure out, wanted to see what your thoughts were on this, what your thoughts were on the family and the impact that, and how important that is in order for the change that we're hoping for to come. I'll start, you can, I'll, I'll start. I mean, look, the, the left has been on a campaign to destroy the nuclear family for 50 or 60 years. In fact, you saw the front page of The Atlantic this week that said the nuclear family experiment was a tragic mistake. And you could, you could check it out yourself uh, at The Atlantic. Now, now, why is that? Well, the family unit is biblical. The family unit is self-reliant outside of the state. And look, I'll point to something that happened in, in the 60s and 70s. Some very profound things happened. We had the Great Society Act passed by President Lyndon Baines Johnson who in a sinister fashion destroyed the American family, specifically the black family, through the welfare state, quasi-socialist policies that allowed Marxist ideas to be infiltrated into our inner cities and people became more dependent on the federal government and more addicted to government programs at the expense of somebody else, but also some more fundamental things. We stopped teaching the Bible in our schools and we got prayer out of our schools. And so I I'm waiting for revival to happen politically to point spiritually, and we should be unapologetic in talking about this, and even some Republican Christians disagree with me on this because they point to a false talking point where I say that we should pass federal legislation that if you receive any money from the federal government, you should teach the Bible in public schools. Right. And now people say, well, Charlie, what about separation of church and state? Now I say, wait a second. I'll get to that second, <laughs> but first, Jack did it too. It's okay. Keep going. He had Charlie, two points. did you know? Did I'll, you, let, I'll, I'll finish no, you no. start. No, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just interrupting. Um, <laughs> did, did you know some guy by the name of Thomas Jefferson, when they saw him and John Adams saw the direction of our nation with the children, uh, that there were, there, was, there were reports that children were having either classroom settings or homeschool settings 
that they were assembling for school without a Bible. And did you know that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams made sure that a Bible play, a Bible had to be placed in a place of education for children or else it wasn't a school? Our founding fathers. When was the last time you heard about that? Right? The very first public school act was the old Satan Eluder Act. And that was to teach children to read so that Satan couldn't deceive them. And they learned from the scriptures, the New England primer, Charlie finished, sorry. And so they, they say, some Republican Christians don't want to fight this battle because they say separation of church and state incorrectly. They also don't understand that right now we have religion in our schools. It's called leftism. That is a religion. It's a core of beliefs, it's values. So the absence of the Bible not teaching the Bible at all, even as a historical document, you don't need to necessarily teach it as the word of God. People will naturally come to that conclusion by being exposed to the Bible and they will understand the stories and the history and the wisdom within the text. However, we've removed it strategically from the public schools. By the way, public schools are still teaching the Quran and they're teaching leftist ideologies at alarming rates. The single book that has an answer to all of our problems, 5,000 years of history, 66, 66 books, 35 authors. That's the book we decide not to teach our youth. You look at the 1960s and 70s after the greatest generation, you had the sexual revolution, you had the attack on Christianity, you had the wrong ruling of Roe versus Wade, which has been a 50 year crusade on the destruction of the American culture. And it has to be the church that will rise up in revival against Amen. it. Amen. We, we can do one more question. You guys, I'll go more if you want. I mean, I'll well, go to you pick me they, up. No, children's ministry. They, we have the, children's they're, ministry. They're all, yeah, they're, they're, I mean, kids I'll, are going I'll, go, nuts. I'll go till you guys kick me out. So. They got, we just got them talking about family. We just got them talking about family, but the problem is they all got kids. That's fine. So, That's not um, a problem. No, it's, it was a joke. I was I just, the blessing is. Yeah. It's a blessing. Is they have children and a blessing from the Lord, Pastor. <laughs> just, just joking. Just joking. <laughs> So which, whichever one of you has the most amazing question. Yeah. We'll just go. We'll, we'll, oh, she knows. We'll do, can we do two more, Jack? Two more. two more. Two more. Good. Yeah, two more. Two good. more. Hi. Uh, good evening. Thank you for being here. And what I want is, is some guidance for, for young people. I have a 16-year-old daughter, a, Laura, a granddaughter, a Laura, who is uh, just an excellent student, strong Christian girl. She's in North Carolina. She clerked at the state government uh, this, this summer and is involved on debate and everything, has, gone, has found your site and really appreciates what you do Thank and you. wants to know how does she get involved with your group? Secondly, for, for any young people that have that type of uh, desire to, to fight for their country and, and to use all the gifts that God has given them, what can you just talk about some of the some of the logical paths they need to take and consider, classes, education, and if you would just speak to that. Happy to, so thank you for the question. So for anyone that might be interested in, in getting involved with uh, Turning Point USA, we're now on 2,000 high school and college campuses across the country. Uh, we had 5,000 students at our end of the year event. Um, website is a great place for her to start. She can fill out a form there. It's a super easy website to remember, tpusa.com. So USA with a TP in front of it. Um, and we're bringing these ideas to high school and college campuses every single day. I personally visit dozens every single semester and I give this exact same message to sometimes very, very hostile college crowds. So here's some just general advice that I have um, when it comes to young people, college, and in general. We need to ask high school seniors, hey, why are you going to college, not where are you going to college? We, 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 do, a, we do a really, really bad job of over-glorifying the institution of college and stigmatizing carpenters, electricians, tradespeople as somehow less intelligent. I want, you, I want you to think very clearly about this. Think about this. When you're gonna watch presidential polling, the media is gonna divide America for you. You know how they divide it for you? The approval rating of the president for college educated and non-college educated. Yeah. What are they saying for you? Here's what the smart people think, yep. and here's what the dumb people think. In fact, I think it's the opposite. I think the non-college educated people are far more wise than the college educated people. What that subtly and subliminally does to parents out there 
is they say, I don't want my kid to ever be in the non-college educated category. If you want to play Russian roulette with your kid's values, send them off to college. They may come back someone completely and totally different. If they want to be a lawyer or a doctor or something very specific, and they got into a very good school that is financially realistic for you, then college might be the best option for you. We have way too many people going to college in America. Like 90% too many people going to college. It should be about career preparation, not ideological exploration. And people all the time, they say, well, Charlie, where is my kid going to get knowledge? If, that, if your child sat down and watched every single PragerU video, they would be infinitely more wise than the professors that would be teaching them on the universities. Here, in closing, as I, I know we got children's ministry, I don't want to get in the way of that, but look, there, there's a lot of advice I give to young people. I'm a contrarian, I'm a radical with this way, which is have your children divest from social media at the youngest possible age. And th uh, this is somebody who has millions of followers on social media, and I rely on social media to get my message out. So maybe pick one social media platform that you'll have for your kid, maybe. I, I only have one, it's just Twitter. My team manages the rest. It's been one of the most liberating things I can possibly describe to you. I don't have Instagram, I don't have Facebook, I don't, and all of it, gone. I just do Twitter, because it's just, there's a special relationship with Twitter, and I just <laughs> really enjoy it. But seriously, the amount, I talk to young people all the time, especially young women, I say, what are you most anxious about? Social media, social media. It's the driver of comparison. It's the driver of bad behavior. I say, you don't need to have it. It's not mandatory. And I know that's a radical, radical idea. And the other contrarian idea that I have for young people is to really consider taking a gap year before going to college. Um, taking one year to, if there's something you're really passionate about, I guarantee you the size of this church, there's an expert in this church that is in that field. I am, ex I am passionate about media. I'm passionate about cars. I'm passionate about plumbing. I'm passionate about the trades. Find that person in this church. This is the young person I'm talking to right now. Look at them in the eyes. Dress not how you might dr dress. Like this, this is fine, nice. Look at them in the eyes and say, you don't have to pay me. I'm deeply passionate about what you're doing. Will you allow me to study under you and mentor under you for one year, for no pay? I will do whatever you ask because I'm passionate about this thing. Please give me a chance. And in a church community, they probably will say yes. You will learn more in that one year about either your, you might not actually be passionate about that thing after like two months. That's a really, really good thing to find out. Guess why? No debt, right? No sorority or fraternity you had to rush of people that call you, call you friends and they're really not. You'd have to go through any of that, right? Or you actually might find that is something you're passionate about and you're learning from an expert and you're learning for free. In one year, you will be 100 times more qualified than someone that went to University of Southern California studying that same thing. So anyway, I, I This is the last question. You guys, we're going we're gonna to have to go... Quick, we, so we one, sorry, the last one final, Charlie, we're gonna have to go quick. Yeah, all right, here we go. So, which means we have to have him back, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so here's your question. Hey, Charlie, great to see you on my side of the coast for once. Uh, Genevieve Peters, I see you speak all the time and you, you were on fire tonight. Oh, thank you I'm very much. I'm telling you, you were on fire. Thank you. Question, you have an amazing amount of American activists in this room, and I need to know, how do we take back the ground that Islam has actually gained in our education system, as well as our government system, as well as our financial systems? It is an urgent, urgent question. Look, I, I'll screw it as quick as I possibly can. Can I just say one thing? Yeah. I know you don't want me to answer the question. And then I have something to say after that. <laughs> I want all three of you to answer right. it. The Bible says to pray for kings and, the, and those in authority that we will live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence. That's a pastoral epistle. I ask people all the time when I travel the country, name for me your five school board members that you pray for by name and the issues they're dealing with that allow your children in your community to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence and they don't know their names. You wanna make a difference? Step into the public square, go to the school board meetings, support candidates, 
educate yourself and take back the culture. And, and I, I know I'm trying not to point my finger because uh, in 2014, I was like everyone else. I had no clue. I didn't know politics from, you know, elbow from my earlobe. But I know more now. Engage. Take it. I, I have w- w- one call to action on this, and Jack will enjoy this, which before, I, before the election day, if I come back here, do a program called Adopt a Voter. Find one person in your life that you know is going to vote, a likely voter, and spend time with them. Shepherd them, inform them, show them videos. Almost pester them about this until they commit that they will vote correctly. If every single person in this church did that, it would double instantaneously. And you'd be amazed, everyone is worried about macro, 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 what do I do to fix the big problem? What the left has done so well is they said, we're just gonna start with your kid. And they did that a hundred million times over the last 60 years. And that's how they've been able to take it. And the by culture. the way, they start with your kids for a lot of reasons, but one of them is they're terrified of adults. That's why they start with your kids, okay? Listen, Act for America, are you familiar with that? You wanna know stuff about Islam, how to expose Islam in the public place? Act for America, Brigitte Gabriel's doing a great work. She's got chapters all across America, pulling the mask off of Islam's infiltration into the public school system, okay? And then there was a young man, Ben, was that your son? Does he have a question? Here, buddy, you wanna ask it? I knew we had more time. Um, do you, do you reach out to your employees if they have different beliefs than you? It's a great question. Um, the answer is yes. I mean, we have, we have a very diverse organization, not necessarily politically for obvious reasons, but, um, look, we, we try to have a Socratic democratic marketplace of ideas and one piece of advice for every young person and give it up for the young man that had the courage to ask that question, more courage than I would have had is, um, be, be unafraid from a very young age to do what the left refuses to do, which is to talk to the other side. It's very tempting not to want to talk to your liberal relatives or talk to your liberal friends or your liberal neighbors. Do what they refuse to do. And that, that is living by the golden rule, isn't it? Which is, it's hard for the person down the street that has the Bernie Sanders sign and the coexist and the Planned Parenthood bumper sticker. But maybe they're one conversation away from having a completely change of worldview. I have seen it happen more times than you could possibly imagine. I have people working for me at Turning Point USA that were marching in the streets for Trump's impeachment two years ago. And all it took was someone with a table on a college campus to look at them in the eye and say, I believe in a system of government where all lives matter and your life matters, that believes in individual liberty and dignity and American sovereignty and American excellence. And you'd be amazed at how shallow and how how fragile the leftism is when we as Christians and conservatives look at leftists in the eyes, love on them, preach to them, and communicate, communicate to them as human beings. They're waiting for us to do that Amen. all the time. So. Okay, Rob. Can I talk about the podcast? It, real simple. Yeah. So you heard two candidates tonight. I'm running for re-election in November, and I want to say this to you. My wife and I commit this. And as citizens of California, there's 15,280,000 evangelical Christians. Half of you are registered to vote, and the other half of you too. You're talking so okay. fast. I have a second one. They're not gonna. They're gonna miss it. Me, 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 no, because it's me, very me, important. Me. 15 million evangelical voters in California. Half of them are not registered to vote. Of the half that are registered to vote, uh, they only half of those registered to vote vote. Got that. So 12 percent, 25 percent of us vote. But here's the challenge to all of you. And my wife and I commit to this every election. You tithe to your church. These candidates are coming to you and it's called consent of the governed. They're asking for your consent to to legislate your sovereignty. And the way you give consent is support them. My wife and I commit 10% of our income every election to candidates we believe in. It's gotta cost you something if you really believe that we make, need to make a difference. It doesn't win elections to be caustic and send visceral emails to your friends. Walk some precincts, host a coffee, put out a yard sign and contribute to the candidate. And if that is offensive, then don't complain because that's how you win elections. God bless you. 
you want me to? You can see okay. Um, so, so Jack, Jack asked me to, to close in prayer. So before I do that, I just want to reemphasize, if you guys do, uh, do that small little thing, uh, subscribe to the podcast by typing it in. It helps imme- immeasurably because people organically are going to wake up in the morning and they'll see the Charlie Kirk show at the top and they're going to hear this exact message. And the very same one I gave last time with Jack on stage um, had well, it was one of the best performing episodes we've ever had. Hundreds of thousands of people listened to it and I got messages of people coming to Christ all around the, around the world. And you guys made that happen. So if you guys do that, it would be a great blessing to me. So if you will join me, join me in prayer. So dear Lord, thank you for this incredible church for this chosen leader of Jack Hibbs and everyone that is here tonight on a Wednesday voluntarily spending their time. Lord, we pray for our country. Yes, God. We pray for our president. We pray for people that are seeking spiritual and political revival. We pray for the unborn children. And we pray for the mothers that will come to the revelation that they choose life. Lord, we thank you for everyone gathered here, that action will be taken and that truth will be fought for. Hey, thanks for watching Real Life YouTube channel. And if this message has been a blessing to you, then just click the subscribe button because we'd love to keep you up to date on what we're teaching on and what's coming next. And if you'd like to help us increase our reach in getting out these messages to a greater audience, then you can help support us by becoming a partner by simply clicking on the link in the description box below. So listen, we wanna thank you for helping us get the word of God out to the ends of the earth.